Hi, in this video, I'm gonna talk about unit testing in JavaScript, how to get started, or if you already started, how to get good. First, I'll talk about why we're actually writing unit tests. Many people nowadays are writing unit tests because the build server fails if they don't commit. Somebody told them to write unit tests or they've just been doing this for three years and they're on autopilot. It's important to understand why we're actually writing unit tests because if we keep that purpose in the back of our head, it makes us write better unit tests. It gives us a clue as to how to write a good unit test, which is the second part of what I'll talk about. We'll talk about the testing pyramid, which is the concept of mitigating different risks on different levels. You have unit test, integration test, and end-to-end -end tests, which all serve a different purpose. Next, I'll talk about examples and patterns. Uh, there's many ways you can solve specific problems with the unit test. And um, we'll look at a minimally viable unit testing framework to understand how Jest works. Let's get into it. First, the purpose of unit tests. We need to keep the purpose of unit tests. What are we actually trying to achieve? We need to keep it top of mind. Otherwise the quality will decline. It's very easy to write tests that pass, that go through the code coverage, that the build server will accept, that will slip through the cracks of a code review by a peer. It's very easy to write tests that don't add any value. So what is the purpose of unit tests? What are we trying to achieve? It's threefold. Unit tests should document our code, they should validate our assumptions, and they should increase our confidence about code. I'll explain all three throughout the video. Documenting our code, because a unit test should show how a function is used. If there's multiple ways of using a function, argument X, argument Y, no arguments, possible different return values, it should be reflected in the unit tests. What are the edge cases? A unit test should also validate our assumptions. We have baked in our code, in our implementations, we have made assumptions about the outside world, about the input, about its output, all kinds of assumptions. And a unit test has as a secondary goal to make these assumptions explicit. And thirdly, to increase the confidence we have about our code. They should lower the risk of failure. Code can never be bug free. People assume that unit tests will help us write code that works. It isn't actually that simple. We will still write bugs accidentally. Unit tests should help us look for what the actual problems were when we ran into a bug and we need to find where the problem is. We want to know what a function can do, how it's exactly should be used, then look at how it's used. Um, and it should also be very explicit about what it cannot do. Again, that's the assumption part. To put this into practice, you can ask yourself these three questions while writing unit tests. Do these unit tests document my code? Do they validate my assumptions? Do they increase my confidence about the code? Do they actually lower the risk of failure? Is this unit test merely passing? Is it actually adding value? Another thing to be aware of is that not everything needs to have a unit test. I've got a function here that has no implementation, no logic, no branching. It's basically only taking an input, calling an implementation somewhere else, not actually doing anything, just returning that value again. There's no value in writing a unit test for this. I would not write a unit test for this. It's important to look at a function and realize this is not actually having any branching. A branching could be an if statement. If there's multiple paths through a function, that is what we call branching. If there is no branching and there is no logic happening, nothing that can influence the outcome of a function in another way, there's no value in unit testing it. Skip it completely. In addition, it's important to consciously decide on what level of tests you want to mitigate a specific risk. There's a well-known model for this called the testing pyramid, which explains the different properties of the different levels. So unit tests run really fast. You can run thousands of unit tests in just seconds. UI tests run really slow. They may also be slower to write, but the point here is the quick feedback cycle of unit tests. UI tests often take a long time to run and therefore they are more costly to write. They do test a specific different thing. If you take the example of a shopping cart, um, a unit test is really good at 
testing whether, for example, um, the taxes are calculated correctly and all the prices of the checkout items are added together correctly. But if you want to test how multiple components integrate in, say, a multi-page checkout flow, you're better off on the top level uh, UI tests, which help you test the integration of all these components. Do note that this is slower to run and it's more expensive to write. So writing tests for all the different edge cases is probably not going to be cost effective. You're better off testing the different edge cases in the unit test level. That's just a cheaper way of doing it. It gives you a quicker feedback cycle. Next, I've implemented a very, very minimal and naive unit testing framework to illustrate the simplicity of something like Jest. Let's get into it. In here, I've got my implementation, my so-called unit testing framework, and I've got a few unit tests to demo them. The implementation that I'm using, the range function, is generating a list of numbers from min to max, and I want to test the assumption and assumptions that I'm making about it. I want to test what it can and what it cannot do. My very minimal unit testing framework, I'll go through this in a bit. My unit tests are specifying in the same syntax that Jest is using uh, what the test case is, and then it's uh, it has a function as the implementation. So as you can see here, as I'm using the assert library, this is actually a standard Node.js module. Assert is a library that has provides a lot of assertion functions. I'm using the deep equal here because I'm testing for an array and it's just comparing these two arguments and it's throwing an error if they're not the same. This is basically the same thing that you find in Jest, only there it's different syntax, but it's sort of the same feature. You can think of it that way. If this fails, it throws and that means my tests will fail. So if I have a one here, and I would run my tests again, it would now fail because this is not actually how my functions implemented. Remove it, it passes. So how does this work? The run function is simply iterating over a set of tests and it's seeing if it throws and reporting results. So let's walk through this. We have an array of tests. That array is being populated every time we call the test function, which is when we define our tests. We have multiple tests here. Let's look at them in a bit more detail. They're all running their own asserts, but if you look at the structure, it's a string and a function. This is what Jest also uses. It uses literally the same syntax. So we have this array of tests. Every time we define a test, we're calling this function, we're pushing an, pushing an object onto the tests array. When we're ready to run the tests, we're running it here manually. Jest, of course, does this automatically, but we have a very, very minimal naive unit testing framework, so we have to do that manually. The run function iterates over the tests array and just runs the function. If it passes, it reports its name. Same for the failure, but then with error message so that we can actually get the results. So here you can see an example of the failure. The message that's being provided by the default node assert library is already pretty complete. So it tells you, I expected this value to equal this, and it's not. These things are not the same, so I'm throwing an error. If it passes, we're just printing this. And this is already the basics. Let's look at our range function. It takes two arguments, the min and the max. The min, however, is inclusive and the max is exclusive. If we want to know what this means, a quick glance at the unit test will already tell me if we're keeping them equal, we get no output. If we're just giving them a difference of one, we're getting the first argument, the min, but not the max. So exclusive probably means it's not being added to the results array here. Same for the longer example. I've got two asserts here for this test because they're testing for the same thing. This is not a different edge case. And the third test is telling me it also allows handling starting at higher numbers, not at zero or one, it allows starting at five. Now, while these tests are a good start, there are still a few cases missing. What if I give my range function negative arguments? Does it support it? 
Does it not support it? My tests don't specify it. I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know what the developer intended. What if I give a lower max than my min? Does the range function support decreasing numbers or does it only support increasing numbers? I should probably write these test cases. It supports negative numbers. Great success. I don't know what will happen here. So since this doesn't make sense, I will actually want to change my implementation. Now that I've written this unit test, I think these are all fine. This makes sense. This does not make sense. I'm getting an empty array as a result. That does not make sense. Now the next step would be to either implement this feature or supporting decreasing numbers or actively explicitly not support decreasing numbers by for example implementing if max is lower than min throw new error not supported and then test for that we need to turn this into a function because it needs to be called before it can be caught It does make sense, hopefully. And there we go. I am now more confident about this code. My test cases document my code well. I've uncovered a hidden dependency. I've made it explicit. I've even changed my implementation. I've let my unit tests change my implementation. These unit tests are very good documentation of my code. Let's look at another example. On the left, I've got my implementation. On the right, I've got my tests. And I always close them up so that I can only read the titles. This gives me the feel of documentation. I can read these titles. I can already gather a lot of information about it without being distracted by the implementation. These implementations might, might be quite long. There may be multiple pages of tests, but right now it's really clear what's happening here. If I'm reading these sentences and it's actually not clear what's happening over here, if it's not functioning as documentation, I know what to improve next when I'm either reviewing this code or when I'm revisiting this code and I need to update it anyway. Let's tackle this. Let's add more cases. Let's change up these sentences if they don't make sense. A common pattern that I also want to talk about is the arrange act assert, the triple A pattern. It is basically saying structure your tests in three steps, arrange, act and assert. A range being all the setup that needs to be done before you can run your test. Act being doing the actual method call is current meal plan is the function that we're testing. This is where the method call is happening. Asserting the results are as we expect them to be. Very often they're setup code. Just structuring it this way, putting a simple new line in between these three phases of tests actually increases readability by quite a bit. Some people put the comments here. Quite quickly, you don't need them anymore. All of these tests have this pattern. They're actually pretty similar. They're still expecting different results. This means you'll have an easier time scanning through these tests and spotting only the differences. 
So what does a popular framework like Jest do better than my super minimal, naive testing framework? It does a lot, actually. First of all, it gives you a lot more information because of how it pretty prints results in, in progress or errors and code coverage. And this all makes your life easier. It's also running your tests in parallel. This means they're running a lot faster. Just calls assertions uh, matchers, which is a different word for the same thing, basically. Uh, we used assert, they use expect, expect stuff to be stuff. They have to equal, they have to be, they have all kinds of matchers that are just gonna help you create code that is a lot more readable. Put a knot in between there. They have them for numbers, for strings, for many, many different things. I would highly recommend looking around at the website. Just gonna go through a few. Testing asynchronous code, whether you're using promises or async await, use then or make your wrapper function async. Just supports it. Very often when you're, arrange, when you're outgrowing a range act and assert, uh, you're gonna get more setup work or repeating setup. You wanna have a before each, after each, one-time setup and recurring setup. Mock functions allow us to fake the implementation of a dependency, just enough to fool the code we're testing that it somehow re receives an actual implementation, but it didn't. Using a mock function is really easy. You can generate mocks with Jest and then the code we're testing is convinced this is enough as long as this is a function it can call. We can then test whether that function was called, how much, with what arguments. It's actually really important to keep the unit in unit testing as small as possible. If it fails, you know exactly why it fails. Say you have a function that makes an API call. If it actually does that API call and the function then is not pure, it depends on the internet to work, it depends on your Wi-Fi router to work and all kinds of other things. If it fails, you don't know why it failed. It could be that your implementation has a bug, it could be that your Wi-Fi is down, <laughs> it could be that the server is down, it could be anything. You don't know what's going on until you really start digging deep. You want to prevent that. If you mock your API call, you give it a fake function so that it is not actually making that API call, then you would have certainty when this function fails, it is your implementation. It's not your Wi-Fi router, it's not the internet, it's not something else out of your control. Make the unit small. This will give you certainty. To summarize, keep the purpose of it all in mind. When writing test code, question yourself. Does it actually add value? Is the code that I'm writing, is it improving the documentation? Is it making my assumptions explicit? Is it improving it? I'd like to end with a quote from Martin Fowler. Test code is as important as production code. Saying, this is only test code, is not a valid excuse to justify sloppy test code. It matters. And that's it. I hope this was useful. If you have any thoughts or requests for things you'd like to see, leave a comment and subscribe. Thanks for watching.